Shabbat Shalom, everyone. This is Paolo Roy here in S of SY7, live here in Italy. So it is, uh, what time is it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's 7 o'clock and still bright and sunny. What's crazy here is I think we're about to hit the longest day of the year here in June. Um, the sun doesn't go down till almost 10 o'clock. So... I've, you know, I've experienced between 9 and 9.30, you know, even in America, but almost 10 o'clock here, that's just like crazy. It just seems crazy. Anyways, you know, military time, 20 hundred hours, and we still got sunlight in the sky. All right. Well, today's message, um, Daniel was going to preach, uh, but he uh, he felt like he wanted to really kind of dig some more into his message. And so I told him that... Um, I had a message that was really heavy on my heart, and as you can see, the title of it, We Cannot Escape Yah's Wrath, and so I'm going to dive into that, but before I do, I want to pray, I'm going to pray the Lord's Prayer in Italian, and uh, blow the shofar, so let's go ahead. Padre Nostro che sei nei cieli, si è santificato il tuo nome. <clears throat> Vieni nel tuo reino, sia fatta la tua volontà come il cielo così in terra. Dacci oggi il nostro pane quotidiano, e rimetti a noi i nostri debiti, come noi li rimettiamo ai nostri debitori. E non ci indurre in tentazione, ma liberaci da maligno, perché tuo è il reino, la, la potenza e la gloria per sempre. Amen. Father, thank you and praise you for this beautiful Shabbat day. Thank you for all of your blessings and everything that you give to us, Abba, and just pray and ask that you please be with us uh, during this message, that everything spoken, Abba, be to your glory, that everything spoken be to your blessing, that everything spoken be your truth. And I pray, Father, for the conviction of our hearts. Because your word needs to convict us more than anything else. Your word. It, your, even your word tells us that sorrow brings us to repentance. And Father, it, as much as it is to be in the joy of you, to worship and praise and to shout and, and, and even blow the shofars, we need to be in a place like the, the sinner next to the, the, the rich man who, or the Pharisee that said, I thank you, God, that I am not like this man, the sinner, and the sinner who would not even look up to heaven, but beat his chest, saying, Father, forgive me, for I'm unworthy. And Father, we are unworthy. We are unworthy of your love and your mercy, of your gifts of salvation, of everything that you give to us, but yet we take it for granted, and we become haughty and arrogant, Father. And may we be humbled now so that you don't have to humble us on the day of judgment. And we pray and ask, God, well, may your word humble us. May your Holy Spirit humble us. And may we be in repentance to your truth, to your word, and know that we are not guaranteed tomorrow and that your word says that those who endure to the end shall be saved. So we're not even saved yet. We are on that path of salvation. We are in the direction, hopefully, by your truth of salvation. But Father, we also have to remember that you are a jealous Yah. You are a wrathful God. The, the part that nobody wants to talk about. And Father, we need to remember of the way that you've handled things throughout history and remember what is to come for those disobedient and who turn away from your son. So convict our hearts, open our hearts to your word now. As we get into your word, we ask this in the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen and amen. All right. Forgive me, as usual, my allergies. Hi. Wonderful gift of ever since COVID, I've had feels like non stop allergies. <laughs> All 
All right. So I'm going to blow the shofar, and then, uh, then we'll get right into the message here. Amen. <clears throat> Hopefully, I didn't blow out the speaker. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, as I was saying in the prayer, you know, it's quite common. So many declare certain parts of scripture to be false because of the fierceness of Yah's wrath. Uh, here we're going to get into some examples in scripture on just what those are. There's so many to go over in the word. And I mean, probably half of the word, especially the Tanakh. but i picked some key ones out, and especially one in particular that I've seen so many struggle with um, from pastors to your everyday believer in churches and in congregations who, especially in Messianic congregations where I have seen people declare that is the false pen of the scribe. God did not do that. This is a lie. And you know, it always boils down to the same thing. Either the word of God is truth or it's not. There's no in between. There's no, well, this part is and this part isn't. Either Yah is in control or he's not. And if he's not, then we're following a, a, somebody who's no different than all the other false gods and religions out there. But we know that that's not true. For we serve and follow the one and only true God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who gives us breath, allows us permission to wake up every morning and gives us the breath of life that belongs to him. That God has not lost control of his scriptures. No matter what man's tried to do to corrupt it, it has always proven itself out to be infallible and faithful. And no matter what people try to do to discredit it or anything, they have it has always been a hundred percent failure. So with that said, I'm going to dive into this first part. Um, three different ones that I want to uh, top uh, speak on is numbers. So first one is numbers chapter fifteen, and this is probably one of the biggest controversial ones that I've seen among the Messianics, and even among Christians. <sighs> Sorry. But um, Numbers chapter 15, verses 32 through 36. Now, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him under guard because it had not been explained what should be done to him. Then Adonai said to Moses, the man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So as, excuse me, as the Lord commanded Moses, all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died. Now, when we look at that, we think, you know, I, how many have, have been like, the guy was just gathering sticks on Shabbat. Why, why, why would he be put to death? That my God doesn't do that. You know, my God is is a loving God. He wouldn't do that. He he's not wrathful like that or or mean like that. But we don't know the depths of just exactly what it was he was doing that pertained to the gathering of sticks and the work that he was doing. <clears throat> not to mention the fact that. Yah had already made it clear, and and through the giving of the Torah or um, the uh, the the tablets, the commandments um, from Exodus twelve, as we see the beginning of things being put into place, 
to Israel in the wilderness <clears throat> that that the Sabbath was a day to be set apart. It was a day that you shall do no servile work. It was a day that Yah said says repeatedly all throughout the Torah that if you do any work on it, you shall be cut off and the punishment is death. So why did this man, for one, think that he could just take it upon himself and go and do this with, it, with no repercussions, no consequences, and Yah made an example out of him, if nothing else. But the, po the point is, is that this man sinned before the father, and he paid the punishment, and it cost him his life. And we know that everything about the Torah and, and the things throughout the Tanakh is not only a type and shadow, but a picture of the things to come. But through Yeshua, what greater judgment will we have held against us from disobedience now that we have the sacrifice and death and resurrection of Messiah? And I'm going to touch on that later. But let's continue on with, the, with uh, a couple more of these. Numbers chapter 16. I'm going to read the whole chapter. Now Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Koat, the son of Levi with Detan and Avram, the sons of Eliab and of the son Pelet, sons of Reuben, took men and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you take too much upon yourselves for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face and he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near to him, that one whom he chooses he will cause to come near to him. Do this. Take censers, Korah and all your company, put fire in them, put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it will be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the holy one. You take too much upon yourselves. You sons of Levi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to serve them, and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you, are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against them, him? And Moses said to call the Tan and Avram, the sons of Eli, uh, Eliav, but they said, we will not come up. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the land of flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Then Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, Do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt one of them. And Moses said to Korah, Tomorrow you and all your company be present before the Lord, you and they, as well as Aaron, let each take his censer, put incense in it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord. 250 censers, both you and Aaron, each with a censer. So every man took his censer, put fire in it, laid incense on it, stood at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting of Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. So here we got Korah and his, the 250 cohorts, as it were, who come against Moses and Aaron, coming against Yah's anointed, all right? Just like anybody who comes against his word, anybody who comes against Yeshua, anybody who comes against any part of the writing of the word, they're coming against the anointed authority put into place by Yah, 
Here, Korah and his company are doing the very same against Moses and Aaron. And now Yah speaks. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Then they fell on their faces and said, O Elohim, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation? So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get away from the tents of Korah, Datan, and Avram. Then Moses rose and went to Datan and Avram, and the elders of Israel followed him. He spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Datan, and Avram. And Datan and Avram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Now it came to pass as he finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart under them. The earth opened its mouth, swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah with, their, with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them and they perished from among the assembly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry. For they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. Now, before I continue on, so, so real quick, I want to touch on this. All of these men killed their families because of their direct disobedience and said plainly that they rejected the Lord. Now, it, they didn't deny Yah, but they denied the authority that Yah put upon Moses and Aaron. I mean, think about this. They just witnessed Moses and Aaron do all the things that he did before Pharaoh. All of the 10 plagues and the miracles that no man has ever done before, parting the Red Sea and all of this stuff. And yet they dare rise up and speak against them. And this is after they already were involved in, 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 in creating the red heifer uh, or the golden calf, I mean, and sacrificing unto it, calling it the name of the Lord, and that, that this golden calf was their deliverer from Egypt and all of this stuff. And they've already been committing all of this atrocity and sin against Yah without any concept of the consequences or the wrath of Yah to come upon them. And for the men... Not only was the wrath brought upon them, but because of their sin and they're the head of their household, that wrath came upon their wife, wives, and their children. So the whole family paid the price for these men and their direct disobedience, their direct rejection of Yah by rising up against these men appointed by Yah. What do you think is going to happen to you? or me, or any of us, when we come against the very word of Yah and try to declare it to be anything contrary than what it actually speaks? What do you think is going to happen to us when we speak against Yeshua's authority or what was prophesied about him when we have certain so-called believers who declare that Yeshua was not born of the virgin, but that came about through the natural means of a man and a woman, these kind of things, or those of Christianity who declare that the Torah is done away with, the commandments are done away with, we don't have to keep the Sabbath, and all of this stuff. This is the same rejection of the Lord that Korah and his company did against Yah. It is the same spirit. Let me continue. 
Verse 36, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, tell Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest to pick up the censers out of the blaze for they are holy and scattered the fire some distance away. The censers of these men who sinned against their own souls, let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar because they presented them before the Lord. Therefore, they are holy and they shall be assigned to the children of Israel. So Eliezer, the priest, took the bronze censers which those who were burned up had presented and they were hammered out as a covering of the altar to be a memorial to the children of Israel that no outsider who is not a descendant of Aaron should come near to offer incense before the Lord that he might not become like Korah and his companions just as the Lord has said to him through Moses. On the next day, this is what is just mind-boggling. On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. I guess seeing the 250 men and their families be killed by God the day before wasn't enough. They decide they want to rise up again. You have killed the people of the Lord. Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting. And suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, get away from among this congregation. I may consume them in a moment. Again, Moses and Aaron interceded on their behalf and they fell on their faces. So Moses said to Aaron, take a censer, put fire in it from the altar Put incense on it and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly. And already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the incense and made atonement for the people. He stood before the dead and the living. So the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,007 hundred besides those who died in the Korah incident. So Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle meeting for the plague had stopped. So right there in, in this single chapter, we see two major events of Yah's wrath. We see in the previous chapter, Yah's wrath against one who profaned his Shabbat. Mishpaha, I have here the actual problem with all of us here is we don't know the mind of God, but yet we act like we do. We act like we know the way he thinks. We act like we know his feelings in the situation. We base God off of how we feel, off of how we think, and we, our feelings and our thoughts do not line up with the word. Because if we think anything contrary to the word and the way we think God should or did or whatever act like, then we do not know him. But yet we just assume that if we can dismiss something or declare, oh, that's not my God, my God never would do something like that, then it's going to go away. And it's not for real. And it's not going to exist. That is a delusion. It is, it, is, it is insanity. Because Yah's word never comes back void. But our words do. Our words come back void. Yah's word never comes back void. Let's go to the next one. Numbers chapter 25 verses 1 through 9. Numbers 25, 1 through 9. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people, hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun, excuse me, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Every one of you kill his men who were joined to Baal of Peor. Every one of you kill his men who were joined to Baal of Peor. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel. 
who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now, fouled up mindset that this couldn't possibly happen to us. God would not do that to us, that suddenly God has turned into this soft God who doesn't do this kind of stuff anymore. But that is not what scripture teaches. No, what the problem is now, what needs to be even more feared, is instead of exacting judgment on a constant basis like he does throughout the Tanakh, because of the death and resurrection, the sacrifice that Yeshua, his son, did for us, it was enough to curb his wrath until it's over. And when it ends, Mishpaha, then he will unleash all his wrath for, oh, what, the last couple thousand years? You're talking about, you know, we, we, we think about how many of us allow stuff to build up before we pop, you know, before we lose our temper or, you know, it, it builds up and all of a sudden it, we just suddenly snap. Except Yah is systematic about it. He's like, this price has been paid. Now it nothing's going to change this. And when the time is over, if you have failed, you will get the full extent of my wrath all at once. And we'll get more than that in a second. So second chronicles, no, I'm sorry, not second, first chronicles. First chronicles 21, 1 through 27. Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab, Joab, and to the leaves of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Yoav answered, May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are, but my Lord the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? Nevertheless, the king's words prevailed against Yoav. Therefore, Yoav departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Then Yoav gave the sum of the number of the people to David. All Israel had 1,100,000 men who drew the sword, and Judah had 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not count Levi and Benjamin among them. For the king's word was abominable to Yoav. And Yah was displeased with this thing, therefore he struck Israel. So David said to Yah, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing, but now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. But that's not the end of it. Then the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, prophet, saying, go and tell David, saying, thus says Adonai, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. So he's not able to just ask for forgiveness and, okay, slate's wipe. There's going to be a punishment out of this. I'm giving you one of three choices, and whichever one you choose will be done to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, thus says the Lord, choose for yourself either three years of famine, three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you, or else for three days the sword of the Lord the plague in the land with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now consider what answer I should take back to him who sent me. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of Adonai, for his mercies are very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. So Adonai sent a plague upon Israel and 70 thousand men of Israel fell and God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it as he was destroying the Lord looked and relented of the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying it is enough restrain your hand and the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite then David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth having in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem 
So David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell on their faces, and David said to Yah, Was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? I am the one who has sinned and done evil indeed. But these sheep, who have they, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, O Lord my God, be against me and my father's house, but not against your people, that they should be plagued. Real quick, this is evidence of what it is that the leadership of a nation, of a country, a king, a president, a prime minister, how they conduct their lives before the Lord falls upon the people. If they are a wicked nation, wicked leadership, that wickedness will spread upon the people and the people will suffer the consequences of that leadership's sin, that leadership's wickedness. If he's a right, he or she's a righteous leader, that she will, her blessing will fall upon the people and they will be blessed. We see this very thing before our eyes. Look at America. You see the wickedness of, of its leadership and look at what it's doing to the country. Look at the consequences and the suffering that the people of America are going through because of the wickedness of their leadership. This is why Yah tells us to pray for our leaders. I don't care if you like them or not. It doesn't matter what you think about them. What matters is Yah tells you to pray for them because it's for your benefit as well as hopefully for theirs. But King David was king over Israel and his sin brought death upon his people. And, and David's sin brought the wrath of Yah upon Israel and cost 70,000 lives. Can you imagine that you he has got to stand before Yah and give an account for the deaths of 70,000 men because of his sin? He has to give an account of the death of the baby that he had out of sin with Bersheba, with, uh, with, um, wow, just totally forgot her name. I got Bersheba in my head. But anyways, you know what I'm talking about. Um, um, all of these things that we see, these people have to give an account. Now, Yah has wiped away David's iniquity, so he's not going to pay any more consequence from it because Yah told him he has forgiven him. Your, your iniquity has been wiped away. But Mishpaha, David could not escape Yah's wrath. Israel could not escape Yah's wrath. Korah could not escape Yah's wrath. The people who rose up against Moses and Aaron could not escape Yah's wrath. And Israel over and over and over and over through the Tanakh did not escape Yah's wrath, and neither will we. And that is the point and the heart of this message. We will not escape Yah's wrath. To finish these last few verses, verse 18 to 27. Therefore, the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan and the Jebusite. So David went up at the word of Gad, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. Now Ornan turned and saw the angel and his four sons who were with him hid themselves. But Ornan continued threshing wheat. So David came to Ornan and Ornan looked and saw David and he went out from the threshing floor, bowed down before David with his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, grant me the place of this threshing floor and I may build an altar on it to the Lord. You shall grant it to me at the full price that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. But Ornan said to David, take it to yourself and let my Lord, the king, do what is good in his eyes. Look, I also give you the oxen for burnt offerings, the threshing implements for wood and the wheat for the grain offering. I give it all. Then David said to Ornan, no. But I will surely buy it for the full price, for I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which cost me nothing. So David gave Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the place. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire on the altar of burnt offering. So the Lord commanded the angel and he returned his sword in its sheath. Now here David went and had to give offering and everything. And what we he need to understand in this act here, Yeshua paid the price. Yeshua took the took what was needed to be done. He became that proverbial uh, burnt offering and, and everything that needed to be done to stay the hand of the destroying angel. And 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 David had to go and do this as the king, and he needed to pay the full price. Yeshua paid the full price 
so that it costs us nothing. It costs us nothing because he paid all of it. And if he paid all of it, what do you think that is going to mean if we stand before, when, when we stand before Yah and we have to receive his wrath because of our haughtiness and pride and arrogance in our walk with him because of disobedience to his word and such. We think, so I want to say this. You think you know him and understand him, yet you can't even keep his simple commandments. We can't even walk righteously before him consistently. We always are looking for a way around his word so we, so we can do things our own way. How he handled the wicked in the Tanakh is nothing compared to how he is going to handle those who trample his son's sacrifice underfoot. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. And these are some of the most terrifying scriptures besides Yeshua, excuse me, besides Yeshua saying, I know you not. Those are the worst words. But these words lead to those words. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 28 through 31. Anyone, and I love how the writer of Hebrews, I, I many believe it's Paul, it's never been proven, but whoever wrote it, I love how he touches first on the way it was through the Torah with Moses to what it became through Yeshua after his death and resurrection. Verses 28 through 31, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of Yah underfoot? counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace for we know him who said and this is what no people are all about this verse when it when it works for vengeance on their enemies but they don't want nothing to do with this verse when it's about the vengeance against their own sin Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says Adonai. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And nobody wants to look at themselves in that category. Nobody wants to address the possibility of Yah's wrath being unleashed upon them the church and many others of religion have taken the word of God and they have made the wrath of God to be of no effect, to, to declare that it has been done away with because of Yeshua's death, death and resurrection and, and everything's all hunky-dory and it's, it's a cakewalk to make it to heaven and we got this in the bag and, and all of this nonsense. And the way it is taught on the majority through Messianic congregations and Christian churches and anything else who claim to be of the word of God, they take and treat it as, as a means of personal gain. And they tell people that you can name it and claim it. You can have riches of glory. You can have all these things. You can have the title of rabbi and, and prophet and, and apostle. And people will bow at your feet and lift you up on high and all of these things. And you don't have to be afraid of nothing. And Yeshua is, is, uh, is, is politically correct. And he's okay with everything and anything. And, and, because he paid the price and he just tells you, oh, I just love you. Everything's all right. But that is not what Yah's word says. We will not escape the wrath of Yah if we are not trembling at his word. Do you not understand that the greatest horror of Yah's wrath is yet to come upon this earth? Seven bold judgments and seven trumpet judgments. Wrath and judgment upon earth and man such as no one has ever seen 
It will be horrifying. It will make all of these other places in Scripture of Yah's wrath look like child's play. The big fear of it all is he will judge his house first, Mishpaha, us. He says it in his word that I come to judge my house first. And he says, if the just shall scarcely enter therein, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? If Yeshua says that narrow is the gate to salvation and few shall find it, and that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, but yet we walk and act and speak with such haughtiness and arrogance and there's so much desecration of his word from the Sabbath to the feast to the calendars to the to all of these things from front to back to his salvation and everything that there's nothing but lie upon lie upon lie. And everybody declares, I have been given this, this revelation. I have the truth and I this and I that. And there's no glory being given to the one who is the truth, and that is Yah himself. Are you so confident? Are you so arrogant to say you will not go through this? Can you say with absolute surety that you're saved, yet you still struggle to obey? Are you without sin? I have the most unfortunate situation of a, a brother who I've known for, I think, close to 10 years. And recently he's come to me letting me know that uh, due to a certain event in his life that supposedly happened, he is now sinless and he will never sin again, that he is eternal now and that he he is in his eternal being now. And he... I, He's been following after some guy that is just teaching absolute perverse lies. And now he's he's not even doesn't even matter about keeping Shabbat. He's in eternal Shabbat now. And it doesn't matter about following the word because the word now is in him and he is the temple and and all of these things and he is now sinless. And it's these kind of delusions that Peter warned and, and Timothy and, and Paul and all of them about the very things of seducing spirits and doctrines of demons that people in the last days are going to fall away to. They're going to be seduced and drawn away from Yah. We have 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that says that there will be a great falling away. Because as the things heighten and the spiritual warfare gets worse, people are going to start falling off like flies. Those who, whose faith is, is rooted in the in shallow soil or in the rocks or, or anywhere but the good deep soil, they're going to start falling off by the wayside. And we're going to see it happening more and more and more. And Ms. Baha, I'm telling you, not me, not you, not anybody knows for absolute certainty that we are got it that we are rooted enough that we will not fall away, that it'll never happen to us. But the only way that we can make assurance of that not happening is to do what he said. He said to fast often, be constant in prayer and supplication unto him, bring our mind and our thoughts into submission to him daily, submit and surrender and obey his commandments every day, to walk in his truth, to walk in his word, to study to show ourselves approved unto him. That is what is going to give us the confidence to walk in the hope that we will be saved at the end, that we will endure to the end and not be a part of the great falling away that has begun and is happening and is going to grow rapidly as we grow closer to these last and final days. Salvation is very narrow. Can you declare absolutely that your name is written in the book of life any more than you can declare that you will definitely see tomorrow? 
There is such an arrogance and haughtiness among the believers today. So many act as if their words are unchallengeable. Our words do come back void, but Yah's word never does. So many speak of God, please don't let go of me. But the truth of it is, is he doesn't. We are the ones who lets go of him. And after spending time with patience and perseverance to draw us back, for that is what Yah has been doing since the fall, those who continue to reject his pulling on our hearts, convicting our hearts, eventually he will let go and release you to what you want, to a hardened heart and a reprobate mind. And then it's too late. And you and you merely are awaiting the day of your doom and destruction. Wake up. Stop following. Stop following man. Stop following the lusts of your own heart. Stop messing with Yah's word, his Torah, his commandments. And especially stop messing with and minimizing his son, and the sacrifice he made for you to be saved. We are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. He looks upon those who tremble at his word. He seeks a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Those with haughtiness and pride will be destroyed. Please don't be in that place, or in that group, Ms. Baha. Please don't allow the enemy to draw you in and seduce you with doctrines of demons that are going to teach you the lies of Satan and of man and take you away from the truth of Yah's holy word. We will not escape Yah's wrath. He's just sitting by until it's done. Yeshua's death and resurrection was enough to curb his wrath until the end. But when it's over, if we fall into the category of those in Hebrews 10, 28 through 31, who have trampled underfoot the Son of Yah, how much worse do you think the punishment is going to be upon us? We will be begging for the punishment of Korah and them compared to what's coming. Let's pray. Il Signore ti benedica e ti custodisca. Il Signore facci resplendere su di te il suo voto e ti sia propizio. Il Signore roga e ti il suo voto e ti dia pace. Father, thank you for this message today and I thank you for your word. Father, I beg you to please Please break us and humble us before you. Do not allow us to be those who end up hearing the words from your son. I know you not. But with true need, may we fear the wrath that's to come so that we stay faithful to you, that we walk in obedience to you, that we seek constantly to be broken before you, weeping, beating our chest, Father, knowing that we don't even have, we're not even worthy to look up to heaven in your direction. But Father, to know in fear and trembling that you are the God of all things. You are not a man. You will hold us accountable. We will pay the consequences. And those under our covering will suffer with us if we lead them down the wrong paths as well. And they follow. Their sin be, will be upon their head if they are of the age of accountability, but their death, their sin also, we will be held accountable for causing in them. As Korah and all of them are an example of, as Scripture says, 
Father, may we not have that burden upon us, but may we be a light to those we are covering over. May we lead our wives and our children. May mothers lead their children to walk in the ways of your word and not the false ways of man. To not be given over to the seducing spirits of demons and false doctrines that come as an angel of light. To have that easy way out. But Father, may we fight hard and chase after you and be quick to hit our knees in repentance when you reveal our sin to us and not have closed ears, but to hear the correction of your Holy Spirit. And we lift all of this up to you now in the mighty name of your Son, our Savior, our Messiah, who paid the price for our sin, this free gift, because he paid the cost. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, Mishpaha. Much love from me and my wife, Michelle, here in Italy. We love you all. But most of all, Yah loves you. Shalom, shalom. Shabbat shalom.